So welcome and good evening. My name is Corinne Debray and I'm the managing director at The Foster. Tonight, our guest artist explorer is a local artist, Linda Gass, who will be sharing with us her love of water. Linda is a Bay Area artist who graduated from Stanford with a master's in computer science. She made valuable contributions in software in the tech industry. And happily for us, she was drawn to making art about land use and water issues in the West. Her journey has led her to mountain trails, lakes, and watersheds in the Sierras and the American West to the local baylands. Her knowledge of wild places is based on direct observation and having backpacked and camped and hiked for at least uh, thousands of miles, which she'll talk about, uh, she really has experiential knowledge of place. It's been my pleasure to engage in a few water-related field trips and personal research projects with Linda over the past several years. We share an interest in places where water and nature come together and how those places continue to be shaped by people. Artist, explorer, backpacker, educator, advocate, and photographer, Linda, like Tony Foster, brings a keen observational eye to landscapes, rendering them with great skill and beauty, often taking a compelling aerial cartographer or map maker's view and she educates and inspires us about these places in the process. This award-winning artist's work has been exhibited in the US and internationally. Please join me in giving Linda a very warm welcome to the Foster. Thank you for that really nice introduction, Corinne. Um, and I am delighted and honored to be here as part of this speaker series. And it's really incredible that the Foster puts on these programs for free. And so please join me in giving it up to Jane Woodward and her staff for putting this on. So for those of you, I saw that there are some people who have never been here before when Corinne asked for the show of hands. And for those of you not familiar with Tony Foster's work, I really encourage you to come back another time when you can spend several hours experiencing his work. If you're like me and you're fascinated by the beauty and wonder of our planet, I guarantee you will enjoy it. Um, so I've given my talk a bit of a mysterious title for the love of water over 4,000 miles of walking and 20 miles of thread. And I promise I'll reveal the mysteries to you by the end. So first, a little background about me. Corinne gave you some. Um, I'm both an environmental activist and an artist. And I combine the two to make artwork about water and land use issues in California and the American West. And my approach is to use beauty to encourage people to look at the really hard environmental issues that we face. Uh, like Tony, I take journeys into the wilderness and I make art informed by those experiences. My artwork offers insights into a particular place and it encourages viewers to slow down and really consider that place. Uh, I sometimes make my work in the field, uh, such as the artwork that I'm seated with in this photograph. But unlike Tony, I make most of my artwork in the studio. I've been making art ever since I was old enough to hold a crayon. However, as a young adult, I took a long detour away from making art and eventually returned to it 20 years ago. So this is a photo of me at age seven doing some plein air painting in our backyard with my younger sister. <laughs> and this is in the 60s, so I've got my clear plastic apron. And I want you to really note like the orange juice concentrate cans for cleaning my brushes. <laughs> yeah. I have a lifelong love of working with fabric, which was taught to me by my paternal grandmother. And I inherited her sewing box, which is down here in the lower right corner. Um, she lived in Europe, and she would visit us every summer for six weeks. And when I was young, she taught me how to embroider and sew by hand. So that's where it all began. So here comes the part about that detour I took away from art. I'm the daughter of immigrant parents, and I was fortunate that they saved money for my college education. However, when I announced that I wanted to major in art, <laughs> they told me that as long as they paid for my education, I was going to get a degree that I could earn a living with. <laughs> so I also happen to be good at math, 
and I ended up graduating from Stanford with a bachelor's in math and a master's in computer science. Um, my activism goes back to my college days. I'm wearing this protest sash that says respect human rights. And it was part of this uh, very well organized protest at our graduation against the US involvement in Nicaragua because President Reagan's Secretary of State, George Shultz, was our graduation speaker. <laughs> I was determined to find a way to merge art and computer science in college, and I was lucky to land a summer internship at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which was also known as Xerox Park. And back then, it was the ivory tower for computer science research. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, all you need to know is that the graphics you see today on your smartphones and your computers all started there. When I graduated college, I joined a small software company that was making software for the graphic arts. And I was really excited to be able to combine my interest in art with my programming skills. Uh, this was in the days before startup companies were really a thing. Um, and my advisor thought I was totally nuts to go join a startup. He told me I'd be out of a job in a year. <laughs> But I was only 23, and what did I care about that? Um, I just really admired and respected the founders of this company, and I really wanted to work with them. Well, you might be able to read the name of the company in the papers that are laid out there. It was Adobe Systems. And uh, after a decade of incredible experiences, it was really time for me to do what I always really wanted to do, which was to make art. So I left Adobe, which was one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life, to walk away from a prestigious career. I'd worked so hard to get there um, with no clear plan for moving forward. And it took me a while to get my bearings, but eventually I found a path and I continue to find new paths in making art. And it's definitely the most challenging and the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I make artwork about land, water and land use issues in California. And I spend a lot of time in the summer seeking out the sources or the headwaters of the streams and rivers that we rely on for survival. They're always located in the most beautiful places I've ever seen. The wilderness is also where I go to find magic and refresh my perspective on life. It's vast, and it can be unforgiving, and it really reminds me of my place in the universe. You can only reach these headwaters by foot, and it usually takes several days to get there, so I do a lot of backpacking with my life partner, Rob, who happens to be here with us tonight. So before I show you my artwork, I want to, show, I want to tell you how I got interested in making environmental art. The inspiration for my artwork comes from the connections between humans and the water and the land that we need to survive. Although I have photographic evidence that I loved the rain and snow as a child, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how I got interested in uh, water issues. But I think it had something to do with growing up in Los Angeles. My mom is from Luxembourg, a tiny European country where it rains a lot. And she tried to raise my sisters and me with the superstitions of her childhood. Every night, we had salad with dinner, and we were told that if we didn't finish the salad, it would rain the next day. <laughs> well, everyone in Los Angeles knows that it hardly ever rains, so we couldn't take her threat very seriously. But that planted this nagging question in my mind, because I was surrounded by swimming pools, palm trees, lush lawns, golf courses that all needed a lot of water and it never rained. So where did that water come from? Something did not make sense. And then one day I learned that Los Angeles is really a desert and it imports lots of water from far away to make it look green. And I just haven't been able to let go of that since. So I feel like the topic picked me rather than the other way around, but it's up to me to get the word out. So it just naturally kept crept into my art. So I'm going to talk about my process now. My artwork begins with a concept, usually an environmental issue that affects our water resources and shows up as a visible mark on our landscape in some way. Once I've identified a concept, I do extensive research to learn more about the issue by doing site visits, 
reading scientific publications and reading about the history, talking to scientists, seeking out historical and present day maps and photographs. And my research process helps me refine my choice of subject matter and also the composition for my artwork. So now let me show you how my artistic process unfolds with some specific artworks about something that's very near and dear to me, which is San Francisco Bay. So although we often take it for granted, um, the bay is one of our local treasures. It's an estuary, which means it's a semi-enclosed body of water where fresh water from local streams and the delta uh, mixes with salty water from the ocean. And you can see that most of the land surrounding the bay, it's gray, it's been paved, but it's still home to over 750 species of fish, animals, and birds. And I always like to provide a reference point so that pink dot is the you are here dot tonight. <laughs> So I first became interested in the Bay in the 1980s uh, when I was traveling a lot for business and I was just mesmerized by the mysterious view of the industrial salt ponds I would see from the airplane window. And I just wonder like, what are those unreal colors and shapes? And once I learned what they were and their environmental impact on the Bay, I had to make artwork about it. It just, it became my artistic concept. So a little bit of background here. I began researching and learned that California became a state when, when California, well, before California became a state in 1850, the bay was surrounded by large areas of wetlands, which are shown in bright green on this map. Back then, we didn't know how important these wetlands were for fish, wildlife, and even us humans. We've since learned that they, fix, they filter toxic pollution and they provide habitat for wildlife and they also provide flood protection for us humans. Today, San Francisco Bay is one-third smaller than it once was. Over 90% of the original wetlands have been filled for development or turned into salt ponds. You can see how little of the bright green is left, and it's been replaced by purple for development, orange for salt ponds, and light green for agriculture. It could have been worse, though. In 1959, the Army Corps of Engineers proposed filling the bay to nothing but a deep water ship channel by the year 2020, so all that brown would have been fill. But luckily, this plan was stopped in 1965 by three women from Berkeley who nicknamed themselves the Tea Lady, yeah. Because their ideas to preserve the bay developed when they met for tea in the afternoons. So Catherine Kerr, Sylvia McLaughlin, and Esther Gulick, they went on to form two important organizations, the nonprofit Save the Bay and the government agency, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Okay, back to how things looked in 1998, because I want to show you in the next slide that help is on the way. So watch this lower right corner of the map here. See that? Okay, so that red color on the map shows 25 square miles of developed areas in the bay that were set aside in 2002 to be restored to wetlands. So I'm best known for my textile work, which I call stitch paintings. So I'm going to show you a series of artworks I made about wetlands in the bay. This is a bird's eye view of those mesmerizing industrial salt ponds. These happen to be near Redwood City. And uh, levees were built around wetlands to make table salt, effectively killing the wetlands that were there. So this artwork is called Puzzle of Salt. And although it's great news that some of the wetlands in the bay are being restored, it's really a complex task. And it might take more than 50 years to accomplish because there's technical, environmental, financial, and political problems standing in the way. So the landscape of the salt ponds remind me of jigsaw puzzle pieces, and in turn, those shapes remind me of the puzzle that we need to solve in order to restore them. This artwork is related to Puzzle of Salt. It's the same landscape in Redwood City, and it's called Wetlands Dream. And it's an imagined landscape of what this same area could look like when it's fully restored back to wetlands. 
And, but although it's an imagined landscape, I didn't totally make it up. <laughs> uh, I researched historical photographs of that area to understand what the wetlands looked like before the salt ponds were built. So you can see the, land, the salt pond landscape on the right from a 1974 aerial photograph. And then what that same area looked like before the salt ponds were created, and that told me what the wetlands and all their channels looked like. But it was a black and white photograph, so I wanted to understand, well, what do the natural colors of a wetland look like? And so I visited one of the few untouched wetlands in the bay, which is just off of Bayfront Park near Menlo Park. And so um, here is the painting again to show you how I incorporated the research that I did to create that painting. This one is called Fields of Salt, and it's the view looking north from the southernmost end of San Francisco Bay, where El Viso is. And you can see the Dumbarton Bridge and the old Southern Pacific Railway Bridge about a quarter of the way from the top of the painting. So those two little lines. And uh, what look like farm fields in the foreground are actually salt ponds, um, which are in the process of being restored to wetlands as part of that 2002 restoration deal. I'm going to quickly show you a few other artworks from this series. This one's entitled South Bay. And this one is a view of Newbie Island landfill, of where my garbage is disposed of. And this is a view of the Palo Alto wastewater treatment plant, where my sewage goes. Can I see a show of hands? How many people here love maps? Oh, OK. All right, great. I'm in good company. I'm a map lover, too. And when you see more of my artwork, I think you'll begin to see how map-based my work really is. Can you remember the first map in your life? Mine was a Rand McNally globe. I spent hours as a kid playing a game, spinning the globe, closing my eyes, and putting my finger to a random place on it. Sometimes I'd open my eyes to a place I'd never heard of before with whimsical names like Zanzibar or Christmas Island. But most of the time, my finger would end up in the blue ocean part. <laughs> and it was my first realization of how much of our Earth's surface is covered with water that we can't drink. And of course, I use maps to find my way in the wilderness. This photo is from a backpacking trip we did in the Trinity Alps with friends, and we bought the wilderness maps right before we got on the trail. <laughs> These were the biggest trail maps we'd ever seen, and we joked about how we could use them as an emergency tarp shelter <laughs> or maybe a bed sheet. <laughs> so, next I'm going to tell you uh, about a series I'm working on that explores confluences of bodies of water in California that no longer exist due to human impact, such as dams and diversions. Each missing confluence is paired with a species that's either extinct or endangered as a result. The first work I completed in this series is about the San Joaquin River. It's the largest river in central California. Before the 1940s, the river supported spring and fall Chinook salmon runs that numbered over 300,000 fish. And its regular flow could support large boats like this steamship. But that all changed with the completion of the Friant Dam in 1942. The dam enabled significant water diversions from the San Joaquin for agriculture. So much water is diverted from the river in most years, the once mighty San Joaquin actually dries up before reaching its confluence with the Merced River. Ten years after the dam was built, the count of Chinook salmon was zero, went extinct. But there's an effort underway to restore the river and the salmon runs, because in 1988, 13 plaintiffs filed a lawsuit and successfully proved that the Friant Dam's diversion of water from the San Joaquin violated both the Endangered Species Act and California's public trust policies. It took 18 years, however, to reach a settlement, and that requires the river flow to be restored and salmon to be reintroduced by 2012. So this photo is from November 2009, and it's an experimental test release from the Friant Dam. And here's a map that shows where the San Joaquin once flowed historically. 
and um, its confluence with the Merced, but remember that the San Joaquin dries up before it reaches that confluence. It took them beyond 2012, but in the spring of 2014, um, regular restoration flows from the dam were started, and 54,000 juvenile salmon were released to try to start restoring the spring salmon run. But then if you remember, 2015 and 2016 were drought years. So they had to uh, basically, uh, it negated the efforts. Um, but in 2017, that marked the first year where the river was able to flow all the way from the Friant Dam to the confluence with the Merced. This is the artwork that I made in response to the research that I did. It's a bird's eye view of the confluence of the San Joaquin and Merced rivers paired with Chinook salmon, a species endangered by the uh, disappearing confluence. And the Merced is the blue river coming in from the left, and the San Joaquin is the brown dry river coming in from the right. And here's a close-up detail of the painting and stitching that I did for the salmon. I thought I'd throw in a few images of back, a backpacking trip that we took a couple of years ago in Kings Canyon, where we explored the headwaters of Evolution Creek, one of the most beautiful tributaries of the San Joaquin River. This was in September 2017, the off-the-charts snow year we had, and we were amazed to see so much snow so late in the year. We did not expect to be crossing snow fields at, like this at 10,000 feet in September. And here's the headwaters of Evolution Creek near Muir Pass and the Black Divide, and all this water becomes part of the San Joaquin River. I'm gonna tell you about one more artwork in this series. This one addresses what happened to the once large Owens Lake in the Owens River Valley in Eastern California. This photo was taken before 1913, when the city of Los Angeles began diverting water from the river that fed the lake. This is a satellite image of the lake today. The former lake is the whitish area in the lower white right corner of that photo. And by the late 1920s, the once large Owens Lake had completely dried up. Prior to that, the lake was 15 miles long, 10 miles wide, and 30 feet deep. And here's a photo taken on the ground of the dry lake bed. In a twist of irony on windy days, great clouds of alkali dust get blown up from this dry lake bed and get blown as far as 100 miles away down to the Los Angeles basin, causing air pollution and respiratory problems for the people who live there. So the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power was forced to recognize that there was actually a good reason to leave water in the lake, and they're now having to irrigate the lake bed to keep the dust down. Many species have been affected by this diversion of water and the resulting drying out of the Owens River Valley. And one of the most beautiful ones is the now endangered Inyo County star tulip. This exquisite flower is native to and only exists in California. Rather than create a painting about a dry river flowing into a dry lake bed, which I didn't look, think would look very interesting, I decided to head upstream to the root of the problem where the water gets diverted out of the river. And so it's that site up there with this diversion dam, um, which is about 10 miles south of Big Pine on Highway 395, for those of you who've traveled that area. And this is my artwork done in response to my research. It's a bird's eye view of the diversion site on the Owens River, paired with the Inyo County star tulip, the species endangered by this diversion. And here's a close-up image of the painting and stitching of the endangered wildflower. So when people see my stitch paintings for the first time, they usually ask me two questions. How did you make that? <laughs> and then, how long did it take you to make that? <laughs> so the latter question's really easy to answer. It takes me a really long time. <laughs> and how I make this involves several steps, and I'm gonna give you the Reader's Digest version here. So here's my current studio in San Jose at the Alameda Artworks where I make my textile artwork. My dyes and resists are stored against the back wall on the shelves. My sewing machine's in the foreground and the table where I do my painting is behind it. 
I paint my landscapes on silk, uh, so I begin by stretching a piece of white silk in a wooden frame. I make a drawing of the landscape uh, that I'm gonna paint, and then I trace it onto the stretched silk using a special pencil that stays on the silk long enough for me to make my painting, but it eventually washes out. I use liquid transparent silk dyes and mix all my colors from the primary cyan, magenta, and yellow. And then I use black to make darker shades and I just dilute it with more water for lighter shades. This is a dye mixing chart I made from those primary colors and the black. And this way when I wanna mix a color, the chart helps me figure out the proportions of the primary colors that I need to use. Silk painting is really similar to watercolor painting. You paint the light colors first and the dark colors last. Because the dyes are transparent, just like watercolors are transparent, it's not possible to put a lighter color on top of a darker one. So like Tony, I have to plan how I'm gonna apply my colors to my paintings. I mix my colors drop by drop using eyedroppers. So when I put a drop of blue into this yellow dye, I get Green. <laughs> yeah, back to second grade color mixing. Okay, these are my brushes. Most are just regular watercolor brushes, but I do have in the lower right corner some special Japanese brushes that I use for blending colors into a smooth gradation. The silk dyes will bleed into the fabric just like what happens, similar to what happens if you touch an ink pen to a shirt. It's just going to start making a spot that spreads and spreads and spreads. Um, so I use a resist to create boundaries for the dyes. And the resist is similar in consistency to white glue, and I apply it from a squeeze bottle with a really fine tip. And when it dries, it acts as a barrier to contain the dye. I apply the dyes with watercolor brushes. I build up multiple layers of dye and resist to create my final painting. And you can see how the resist is acting like a barrier to contain the dyes. And it only occurred to me recently that I'm using the resist to build levees and dams to contain <laughs> the dyes, just like the levees and dams that my work's bringing attention to. So when I'm done with the painting, I create a sandwich with my silk painting on top and then a layer of fluffy material called batting and then another piece of silk on the bottom. And then I stitch it on my sewing machine um, using colored embroidery thread to create a highly textured sculptural landscape. I use the capability that exists on all sewing machines called the free motion embroidery or darning feature where I guide the fabric under the needle instead of letting the machine guide the fabric. And this video is being played in real time. I did not use slow-mo. So now you know why my work takes me so long to do. <laughs> so I promised I would reveal where my provocative title came from. And here's the story behind the over 20 miles of thread. Since 2008, I've been saving all the plastics I can't recycle. And that includes the plastic spools for my sewing thread. Uh, so when I added up the number of meters on the spools I've saved so far, it comes out to over 20 miles worth of thread that I've sewn on my sewing machine over the past 10 years. <laughs> so next I want to tell you about an artwork I did that looks at the consequences of climate change and the past policy of suppressing forest fires. This work is about the impact of the Rim Fire on the Tuolumne River watershed. The water you drink here in Palo Alto comes from this watershed and 2.4 million people in the Bay Area rely on it. In the Pacific Northwest, they have rainforests, but here in the Sierra, we have fire forests. Fire is a natural part of the life cycle of healthy forest ecosystems and many species rely on the fire for survival like this giant sequoia in Sequoia National Park. It's common to see burn scars like this on living trees, but for many years, we thought we were saving the forests by not allowing them to burn. But if you combine drought, summer heat, and an abundance of fuel from decades of fire suppression, you get a mega fire like the Rim Fire that burned so hot and fast, it consumed entire trees. 
The fire was started by a hunter's illegal campfire near the Rim of the World Vista Point on August 17, 2013, during the hottest part of the summer and two years into a significant drought. This photograph was taken on August 22, five days after the Rim Fire began. I was on a bus to Yosemite Valley to begin a section hike of the John Muir Trail, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a pyrocumulus cloud. These clouds are formed by the intense heating of air by a very, very hot wildfire. As the hot air rises, it cools and condenses the moisture in the air into the cloud formation. But pyrocumulus clouds look distinctly different from cumulus clouds. I don't know if you can see, but to me it looked like a cancerous cauliflower. It's not puffy and it's nice. And it also has a grayish tinge. So this map shows how quickly the fire grew. It expanded to nearly 400 square miles in just over seven days. And it took more than two months to fully contain it. And it's still the largest recorded wildfire in the Sierra. This map shows how much vegetation was burned within the rim fire boundary. Red represents the most severely burned areas and accounts for almost 40% of the total area. And many of the red areas are directly adjacent to the Tuolumne River and its tributaries. This is what a severely burned area looked like two months after the fire started. You can see there's nothing green left. And this shaded map shows the area of the entire Tuolumne River watershed. And the rim fire is outlined in red, and you can see that 96% of the fire was in the watershed of the Tuolumne River. And there's long impacts long-term long impacts from this fire. Water quality has been affected by ash, fire retardant, and soil erosion. And some of the severely burned areas may never recover to forests, which will change the watershed forever. For the artwork, I used the language of maps to show how much of the watershed was severely burned. So this is a close-up of the overall drawing for the artwork. I created an enlarged, an enlarged transparent version of that vegetation burn severity map, and I laid it on top of the seven and a half minute topo maps for that region. And I traced the topographic lines only in the red severely burned areas. And I did that under the rationale that now that the vegetation is completely burned and gone, if you were looking at it from above, you could see the topography of the landscape. Okay. I then transferred my drawings onto black silk and I stitched them on the sewing machine using blue thread for the Tuolumne River and its tributaries and light gray thread for the topographic lines. The boundary of the fire is shown by the dashed stitched line and the burned areas that weren't severely burned, I stitched in this kind of loop-de-loop -loop stitch to give it a chaotic look. And then I used grid stitching outside of the found fire boundary because everything was normal and orderly. So here's the entire artwork where the affected watershed's been divided up into 12 squares. The blue thread of the rivers and reservoirs like really pops out of the black silk. And the abundance of light gray topographic lines highlights just how much of the landscape was reduced to ash. One year after the fire, I revisited some of the severely burned areas. And many of the burned trees in the national forest areas were logged in what was called a salvage logging effort uh, to harvest that wood for timber. Um, and while this brought a nice temporary economic boost to the logging companies and the local communities. It robbed the forest of the ecosystem benefits of the Deadwood's role in regenerating the forest for future generations. But I was encouraged to see a variety of new saplings growing up from the charred landscape. And I also stumbled upon this random piece of art in the logged forest. I have no idea who made it. And I'd love to know like what the significance of the kind of chair back that they used was. But it was a real surprise and delight to see. Large fires are now the new normal in California. And over the past three summers, our backpacking trips have been severely impacted by them. 
This photo was taken last July uh, while hiking a 160 mile section of the Pacific Crest Trail. We saw smoke and an ominous pyrocumulus cloud from our campsite. And this was what the air looked like a few days later as we neared Lassen National Park, the endpoint of our hike. And we were inundated with smoke from the car fire near Redding. And the air was seriously unhealthy to breathe. We didn't have masks with us, so we soaked our bandanas with water and put them over our nose and mouth to try to reduce the smoke we were inhaling. From now on, I'm going to carry an N95 respirator mask in my backpacking first aid kit. In addition to my stitch paintings, I also create art installations in the landscape where the installations are site specific. This is also known as land art, and I want to share with you a series of installations I did using textiles in the landscape. One of my installations is about the streams feeding Mono Lake, one of the oldest lakes in North America, believed to be over 700,000 years old. During the past 50 years, it's been at the center of a debate over whether the wilderness is a preserve for nature or a, res a resource for humans. Court battles over the lake have challenged and actually changed the interpretation of California's water laws. The lake plays a vital ecosystem role. It's an important stopover for migratory birds on the Pacific Flyway, and it's the ancestral breeding ground for the California gull. In 1941, the city of Los Angeles began diverting water from the lake. By 1982, the water level had dropped by 45 feet. The lake lost half of its volume and doubled in salinity. In 1994, after a decade of litigation, the State Water Board ordered that some of the water that's diverted to Los Angeles be allowed to flow back to the lake instead. As a result, the lake has risen by 10 feet to the level it's at today. And this is just another way to look at how much water's been lost in terms of outlines in this satellite image. Diverting less water forced the city of Los Angeles to start conserving water. So they installed over a million low flow toilets and they used recycled water for landscape irrigation. And it just goes to show you conserving water really can make a huge difference. So this is one of the creeks that flows to Mono Lake, rushing with winter snowmelt. And these are two of the many diversion gates operated by the city of Los Angeles. The simple opening of one gate and closing of the other diverts water destined for Mono Lake into the aqueduct for Los Angeles instead. It was really tempting to mess with these <laughs> gates when I was there, but I swear I did not touch them. So this was actually the first land art installation I ever made. I chose to work in colored nylon tool, a sheer fine mesh that becomes more opaque as, as it's bunched together. And my goal was to use the water-like nature of the fabric to recreate waterways that no longer exist. And this is another view of it. I've entitled it Rivulet at Parker Creek. And it's constructed on a dry glacial moraine. And it represents two kinds of water that are no longer there. The ancient glacial melt from the last ice age and the water diverted from Mono Lake to Los Angeles. This is just south of Mono Lake. It's the now dry Owens River Gorge, that same Owens River that dries up before reaching Mono Lake. And this gorge was formed over thousands of years from the river cutting through the rock. And this is a section of the Owens pipeline carrying water diverted from the Owens River to Los Angeles. And here's a photo of it with a person behind it for scale, just to show you how huge it is. And if you walk up right next to it, you can feel and hear the massive amount of water moving through it. So this is a, another land art installation I did called Water Entrapment at the Owens River Gorge, where I recreated a waterway from the nylon tool in an area of the gorge. And here's another view of it. I built it in an eroded channel in the rock to represent the water that used to flow in the Owens River and is now diverted to Los Angeles through the pipeline instead. And I want to make sure to tell you that all these installations were temporary. I didn't leave these fabric pieces out there. 
So I created them, I photographed them, and I took them down all in about one to two hours' time. So I did another series of textile land art installations in the central Great Basin of Nevada. This is Pyramid Lake, one of the largest remnants of the enormous ancient Lake Lahontan. And it's a major habitat for Lahontan cutthroat trout, and it's an integral part of the Paiute Indian Reservation, and they're one of the few North American tribes never displaced from their home territory. A little history here. The National Reclamation Act passed in 1902 uh, to build irrigation projects in the West to reclaim arid lands for farming and settlement. Diversion of the Truckee River became one of the first projects completed under this act. It significantly reduced flows to Pyramid Lake, causing the native cutthroat trout to become extinct by the 1940s because there wasn't enough water in the river for the fish to swim upstream and spawn, so the fish population died. By 1967, the lake dropped 94 feet below its highest recorded level in 1891. But the water level today has risen by 23 feet because the Paiute tribe sued the federal government and won, resulting in less water being diverted. And the lake is now artificially stocked with cutthroat trout from hatcheries that are managed by the Paiute tribe. So this is a giant tufa formation that originally formed under the lake surface when it was part of ancient Lake Lahontan at the end of the last ice age. And uh, the water level was much higher than it was, is today, obviously. And tufa occur when an underwater spring that's rich in calcium bubbles up into lake water that's rich in carbonates. And when the calcium comes into contact with the carbonates, a chemical reaction occurs resulting in calcium carbonate deposits, which is also known as limestone. So this tufa is now exposed most, mostly due to the natural warming of the earth since the last ice age, but some of it's exposed because of the lowering of the lake. So you can see my land art installation in the foreground. Um, for this series of installations, I made these long, narrow strips of fabric uh, to represent stitches of thread. And my idea was to connect the past and the present by putting giant stitch marks into the landscape using different kinds of embroidery stitches. So here's another view of that same installation. I climbed up onto the tufa and I shot the photograph looking down. Um, and I'm trying to stitch together the past level of Pyramid Lake with the present level using uh, a stitch called a running stitch. So my stitch is actually symbolic. Running stitch is used to sew together multiple layers in a quilt. So I'm sewing together multiple layers of the history here. Another installation I did was in the Black Rock Desert, located about 80 miles north and east of Pyramid Lake. It's a 400 square mile dry lake bed so desolate that nothing ever grows here and is best known as the place where people go for Burning Man. Um, there was an ancient lake here, in Lahontan, that was 500 feet deep, and that dried up at the end of the last ice age. So here's another embroidered landscape I did. I wanted to connect the now dry earth with the former lake by making stitch marks to represent water. So I chose the zigzag stitch to look like the pattern of ripples on the surface of water. The next series of artwork I'm going to show you came out of an art and science residency sponsored by the Palo Alto Art Center and Junior Museum and Zoo called Creative Ecology. I was one of four artists awarded the residency, and each artist was asked to choose a local open space to work in, and I chose Cooley Landing in East Palo Alto. As an artist, I'm interested in how a landscape changes over time and the environmental implications of those changes. This is a bird's eye view of Cooley Landing today, but this peninsula of land didn't always exist. 200 years ago, the area was all pristine wetlands, as shown in this historical map. And I pointed out where Cooley Landing would be if it existed back then. And it was a favorite hunting and fishing spot for the native tribes. And there were so many birds that it was said that the sky was just black with birds and hunters could just catch them by putting out a net. Could you imagine being able to do that today? <laughs> yeah. 
So big changes started happening during the gold rush when it became a shipping port. A shipping dock was built and it became known as Cooley Landing. The biggest changes happened from 1932 to 1960 when it was the San Mateo County dump. You can see in the photographic timeline along the bottom how landfill created the peninsula we know today as Cooley Landing. Unfortunately, this filled in valuable wetlands and it contaminated the soil with lead, mercury, PCBs, and other toxins. After 150 years of industrial use, Cooley Landing is now being transformed into a new open space park. The toxic landfill has been capped with two feet of clean soil. Mud flats are alive with snails and crabs that feed fish and birds. Marshlands support pickleweed and endangered species like the salt marsh harvest mouse. And new native landscaping has attracted black-tailed jackrabbits. During the first part of the residency, the public was invited to do art and science activities at Cooley Landing with me and two art and science teachers. We examined the environment up close with magnifying glasses and then sketched what we observed. We examined mud and water samples under the microscope, and I was really impressed with how much life we could find. So this was the artwork I did in response to these discoveries. You can see the Cooley Landing Peninsula along the top of the painting. And I found it really heartening that even though there had once been a toxic landfill at this site, there was so much life in the water. So the circle on the lower right is the view through the microscope to what lives in the water and mud surrounding Cooley Landing. I also did a community-engaged land art installation during the residency that began as a temporary artwork and has turned into a living public art installation. So for this project, I went way outside of my comfort zone. I usually create artwork in solitude, but this time I invited the public to work with me on creating an art installation to mark the former shoreline of Cooley Landing. So since Cooley Landing was a light landfill site on the bay, it's part of that story of vanishing wetlands around the bay, the same story that I explored in that series about the wetlands around San Francisco Bay. And somewhere on that artificial peninsula land is the former shoreline of the bay. So I needed to figure out where the former shoreline was. So in doing my research, I came across the work of the San Francisco Estuary Institute and they had already figured out the former shoreline using this United States Coastal Survey map from 1857. So you can see the extensive wetlands as well as the shipping pier uh, that was the original Cooley Landing. And by placing this map over a recent Google Earth satellite image, I could locate the former shoreline relative to present day features. So I've zoomed in closer now to show you more details. I've marked the proposed placement of, of the installation in the map in blue, and I avoided areas that were off limits to the public. So the blue mark is where the community would help me install a dense line of blue plastic survey whiskers. And survey whiskers are normally used to mark survey and construction sites. Uh, and I used Natural, I used reference points in the landscape itself to figure out where it would go. So like there's the picnic area, there's walkways, there's a fence line, there's the parking lot with the stripes in the parking lot, there's trees. So on the day of the installation, I marked the former shoreline uh, with landscape stakes and orange flagging tape. And then people from the community helped me hammer in the blue survey whiskers along this line using five inch nails. So this is an excerpt of a documentary video made by my friend Herb Moore. And we had all ages participating. So this little guy, he was three years old. Um, we had people up to 80 years old. And there I am marking out where the approximate shoreline should be using the orange flagging tape. And uh, people would stake out their area where they were going to work and bring in survey whiskers. We had families, uh, you know, kids and parents, and we also worked with a summer camp. That was a city councilman from East Palo Alto. He showed up in his suit. <laughs> and this is an organization, wonderful organization, Girls to Women, that we worked with. 
And here's a view of part of the final temporary installation. It's over 400 feet long, and it's made of 2,000 plastic survey whiskers. And some of you might be wondering why I use plastic, such an environmentally questionable material, to make this. Well, I chose it uh, very much on purpose. The survey whiskers have a lot of benefits, actually. So they're durable for a temporary installation. They don't present a tripping hazard. They just flop right over. I could get this really pretty bright blue color, which suggests water. It's super easy to install, as you saw, and it's also easy to remove. Uh, and I do plan to reuse them for other projects. But people love the installation so much they wanted it to stay. But as an environmentalist, I could not leave the plastic out there. Um, it was fine for temporary, but not for permanent. Um, so I needed to find a new material, and I thought it would be really cool to use native plants to do this. So I consulted a local restoration nonprofit named Grassroots Ecology, and they came up with the perfect idea. They suggested a California native plant called Juncus, and it's perfect on many levels. Um, it kind of looks like the survey whiskers. It's tall, and it's got a bluish color to it. It stays green year round. So in the summer, when all the grasses go green, it's still green. And in the spring, when the grasses are like that yellow spring green, it's blue green. So it's, it stands out no matter what time of year. And it's a native plant, so it's well suited to the climate at Cooley Landing. It's drought tolerant. So with that idea, the Living Shoreline Project began. I partnered with Grassroots Ecology, and they received a grant from the local land agency, the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, to replace the plastic survey whiskers with Juncus. And during the spring and fall of 2017, we worked with community volunteers to plant Juncus along the line of blue survey whiskers. We also worked with groups of school children, like these adorable kindergartners, who to my great surprise were so extremely careful with the plants and so focused. We also worked with uh, San Mateo County uh, Department of Education to involve high school students from six local high schools. And we taught them about habitat restoration, climate change and sea level rise, as well as land art. And here's a photo of the baby juncus that we planted. Each one's marked by a blue flag. And we're temporarily leaving some of the survey whiskers in place until the juncus grow a little taller. We've named this installation the Living Shoreline Project because we're marking the former shoreline of the bay with living native plants. I like to think of it as a living map also. And I hope this installation inspires people to wonder what would Cooley Landing be like today if the wetlands were still here? And what new things do we observe now that the filled land is here instead? And one more fun thing. The other day I was looking at Cooley Landing using Google Earth, and I realized that you can now actually see this land art installation from space. <laughs> yeah. Finally, I want to show you some artwork I've made in glass. This is a cast glass water faucet. Uh, this artwork was made using the lost wax technique and building a plaster silica mold. The artwork is meant to express the vulnerability of our water supply. This is another cast glass piece entitled Tapping Mono Lake, and the outline of the sculpture is based on the current shoreline shape of Mono Lake. And it's asked the question, do we really need to drain ancient lakes to have our precious green lawns? And this is the last artwork I'll show you this evening, uh, which is also about the loss of wetlands around San Francisco Bay. And I'll explain the research behind this in my next few slides. This is a Google Earth view of the Palo Alto Baylands, just a few miles from here. And you can see the airport and the golf course and the corporate industrial park and the landfill um, and all of those and the wastewater treatment plant as well. And all of those were built on former wetlands. So I went back to that 1857 US Coastal Survey map of San Francisco Bay to understand where the original wetlands once were. So to make my artwork, I focused on the wetlands that were filled for development. So this is a cropped view in Google Earth, really focusing on that corporate industrial park, the golf course, the airport, the wastewater treatment plant, and the landfill. 
And then I overlaid that, uh, a digitized version of that coastal survey map. And this is a close-up of the artwork to show you how I represented the built environment as a map-like drawing of roads and buildings. Um, those are the reddish color lines, which is actually copper that's been encased between layers of the glass. And the wetlands that still survive today, I used colored ground glass and sprinkled it on in order to make those designs. And then the former wetlands channels, I sandblasted in from underneath and uh, that way, and you can see some of the shadows cast by on the wall by the wetlands channels and the copper. And there's four layers of glass in this artwork that are fused together in a kiln, and it's a half inch thick. So here's the overall artwork again. It's 35 inches by 35 inches, and it's made up of 16 tiles. It's entitled Ghost of Wetlands Past. And now that we've made it to this point in the presentation, it's time for me to reveal where the over 4,000 miles of walking came from. I did a conservative back of the envelope calculation of the miles I hike each year exploring watersheds. Uh, this counts the hikes that I do in our local watersheds, as well as the longer distance backpacking trips we do in the Sierra and day hikes that we take during road trips. On average, I hike 200 miles locally in a year. I backpack about 100 miles on average, and I hike about 20 miles on average during ro road trips. So that's 320 miles per year. I've been doing hikes focused on watersheds for over 20 years, so I could have picked an even bigger number than 4,000. But I wanted to be conservative, since there have been some years where I hiked less. But then again, there were other years like last year where we backpacked over 240 miles. So I do all my hiking in mesh lightweight trail runners. Uh, hiking boots are so yesterday. <laughs> These shoes are great for hiking long miles without my feet getting too hot and without getting blisters. But the downside is dirty feet. This is after a 15 mile day on a particularly dusty stretch of the Pacific Crest Trail last summer. One of the things that's made a huge difference in how far I can hike in a day is reducing my pack weight. We rarely carry more than a week's worth of food at a time, so my pack never weighs more than 25 pounds. And most of the time, it's under 20 pounds. Um, Rob carries more of our food, so his pack sometimes weighs as much as 35 pounds. But between the two of us, we're never carrying more than 60 pounds. And somehow we manage to stay happy with each other, even when we're tired and we stink from not bathing for a week. And I just want to say I'm so grateful for Rob's support, both during our trips and in everyday life. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for coming tonight. You've been such a lovely audience. <laughs>